This is the end of our second week of class, and I'm going to talk to you about the basics of research. We'll review this a little in our next class as well, since I'm delivering this um, online. So previously, in our last class, we tried to get at the difference between um, science and other ways of knowing. And these are, of course, the ways that we have been discussing in class that were gone over in our Zhang Jiani text, intuition, authority, reasoning, empiricism. And we're trying to take and distinguish this systematic empiricism or the scientific method from the other ways of knowing. And so um, we uh, talked about the story of the blind man and the elephant. And that is how many of these uh, men who had no sight all wanted to learn what an elephant was. And so they all walked up to the elephant to learn about it and know what it was, but everyone touched it someplace different. And this person said, touching the tail, I see an elephant is like a rope. And another one thought an elephant was like a spear because he happened to touch the tusk. Another one thought it was like a hose because he had the trunk. Well, another thought it was like a fan because he had the ear. The one who happened upon the leg said an elephant is like a pole. And the one who happened upon the side of the body said an elephant is like a wall. And each of their perceptions are accurate. This is empiricism. They each had these experiences and yet none of them walked away knowing what an elephant was. And even though we have the good fortune of sight, we still have the same problem. And that problem is that we all wear uh, filters. And the filter that we wear has us see and observe the world around us through a unique perspective that only we have. And so if any of us are in the same space looking at exactly the same thing, we're all going to pick up slightly different things because we're filling in the blanks of our perception with our own experiences, our own biases, our own feelings. What we seek to do in science is remove the lens of bias. And this bias, of course, comes from our identity, our culture, the context in which we're looking at things. And that influences our perception, our behavior and action. And this is what comprises our bias, our beliefs, our judgments, our assumptions. And we lack the capacity, any of us, to get rid of our bias. And so as scientists, we try to step back by putting into place strict methods that allow us to step back from our bias and observe things objectively such that what I'm observing, if you were observing the same thing, you will see it the same way. There's none of my bias or your bias in the story. And then we went on and talked about how this was the difference between objectivity and subjectivity. So subjective statements tend to be based on opinions, feelings, experiences. They aren't necessarily true or false. They're your truth, just like the blind man who felt the tail. Well, in that aspect, the elephant was uh, like a, um, now I forget what he said, um, the one who touched the leg, the, the, it, his perception was, was, you know, in that sense, he was accurate. He did feel and experience the elephant as a post or a pole. And so it's neither true nor false. It's his truth, but it's not objective truth. In the case of subjective statements, interpretations will vary by whoever's making the interpretation. So each of those blind men would have a different interpretation for what the elephant uh, was like. So it varied. And the source of the opinion would make a difference. Now, if it's objective, instead of being based on opinions, feelings, experiences, it's going to be based on indisputable facts, often numerically quantifiable facts. If a statement is made that's scientific, it's either going to be true or not true. Um, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be both because we've taken out that individual lens of perception. Um, this is going to be so objective that a, a robot or a computer could even interpret the numbers. The interpreter wouldn't matter. 
And regardless of who has stated the opinion, it's, go it's not going to make any difference. The interpretation will be the same. So this is what we try for in science, objectivity. But with all of that said, I did try to make the point that the subjective experience is also valid. And to link this to our programs here, and to two types of research, quantitative research and qualitative research. And so quantitative research is what we do when we're looking at objective data. Quantity means numbers. And so the data are going to be structured. Um, if you had taken stats, you'll see that we're structuring the data into a spreadsheet. When we enter a value or a score for any individual, it's into a formula. Um, so we put, if I ask you whether you prefer um, sweeter, salty, or uh, spicy foods when you're stressed out, then whatever answer you put, I'm just going to write down either sweet, salty, spicy, no more detail. So I'm trying to fit it into a category. We'll be doing statistical analysis, which allows us to look for significant differences that can generalize to a problem, excuse me, generalize to a population. Um, we can draw conclusions that are objective, meaning the conclusions are the same regardless of the interpreter. And finally, um, we might do things like surveys or experiments to gather data, to gather numbers that we can use for our quantitative research. Qualitative research, on the other hand, is likely to be more unstructured data. So we, if I ask you what kind of food you like when you're stressed, instead of just writing sweet, salty, spicy, you might write, say, well, I, you know, it depends on the kind of stress, you know, uh, sometimes I like sweet and sometimes salty, and these are the factors that contribute. Um, in this case, this word is spelled wrong, sorry, you would have a summary um, or conclusions that are summarized. So you might put all of the words that people are saying into a paragraph with quotes. You draw conclusions based on how you decided to organize the information, which might be different from the way I did. And so the conclusions are going to have that little bit of bias, depending on what you chose to emphasize and write down. And you might see methods like interviews or focus groups um, as part of the method in qualitative research. Um, and I pointed out that here at Diné College, we have an indigenous methods course which usually, I think, uses both. Um, it uses primarily a qualitative approach that's complemented by quantitative approaches. But because we're getting, you're getting this in your Indigenous Methods course here, in our course, I focus on the quantitative research. Just a little bit more examples. Um, in quantitative, you might see something like 20% of survey respondents bought ice cream today. Whereas a qualitative researcher might say, I bought the ice cream because I saw it when I was in the checkout line. I wanted to treat myself. And so you see this is like rich, deep data, whereas this is sort of categorical data. 50% of people in New York strongly enjoy pizza. Okay, now we have some numbers, but the qualitative person would go deep. The individual experience would matter. I like a lot of toppings on my pizza. Cheese, sauce, pepperoni, olives. Quantitative data might be something like this. On average, respondents rate their grocery store as a 3.5 out of 5, whereas qualitative would be going deep, would be telling the story. The grocery store has good options in general, but the lines can be long, and they're often out of stock of my favorite brands. So again, we're going to focus on the quantitative here, but we will, um, we will consider the role of qualitative. And if you take your indigenous methods, the primary focus will be qualitative, supplemented by quantitative. And these are called mixed methods approach. Mixed methods. And it means that you have a piece of both. But again, in our class, the main focus is quantitative because you have other opportunity in another class to learn the qualitative. So the last thing that I wanted to point out is that there's often been 
argument between, let's say, religion or traditional knowledge and Western science. It's as if you either have one or the other. But I would argue that we don't, we don't need to fight, that they can both exist for different purposes. The Western science would tend to quantify and systematize the traditional knowledge. And the traditional knowledge informs and cautions the Western science. And so if there is, for example, a plant that traditional people through their tradition know about its healing properties, that's extraordinarily valuable. And there's so much respect in there that can be taught to Western science. Western science might be able to, let's say, understand the chemical makeup of it and determine quantities that would be appropriate to systematize its medicinal uh, value. And so I would just say they inform each other. And um, there's a role for both. And the thing is, it takes mutual respect. And this is sometimes what we lack in, in these worlds of conflicting methods. Um, so humility, tolerance, mutual respect, this is what we need in order to have this nice complementary relationship. And that's what I seek. So Western science has an optimal goal of determining this. Does A cause B? That's usually what we're trying to find out. So does smoking cause, cigarette smoking cause lung cancer? Or does uh, exercise cause weight loss? And this word cause is so important, right? Because if we know the cause, then we can influence the cause and alter the effect. So we do find this to be a really important idea. It's linear thinking, meaning we're always wanting to the extent possible to draw a line between A and B, to know definitively that A causes B and there's not too much interference. So we want nice tidy relationships. We know that most things in life are not linear, that they're much more complex. But in science, we're seeking to look for the linear relationship. And one thing that you need to be aware of that we're going to talk about in this content is that not all quantitative studies can determine causality. In fact, there's only one type of quantitative study that can determine causality. So let's look at the types that we'll be looking at uh, coming up later. So we start with descriptive. And descriptive just describes a population of interest based on data from a survey, questionnaire, or a tool. It cannot show that linear relationship, no causality. There's no attempt to infer anything about those who were not surveyed. So if they survey a sample of people, um, excuse me, if they survey people from uh, Diné College and they don't get everybody, the only thing they can talk about are the people who were surveyed. So they describe those people who were surveyed, which then becomes their population. If it's descriptive, you're going to see data displayed in graphs or charts. And you're not going to see any mention of a statistical test. And this means that you're not going to see anything written in there. You're not going to see the word statistically significant. That's only for when you do a test. You're not going to see anything like that. No word significant. You're not going to see anything like in parentheses P less than 0.05 which is, means the probability is less than 0.05. Nope, all those are part of statistical tests and you won't see those in descriptive. Correlational relationships explore the strength of the relationship between two variables, like hours of exercise per week and heart health. So are these two related? Does your heart health in any way correspond with exercise per week? If so, that's a correlation. Our data are presented in a scatter plot, and we're going to look at all of these in more detail. And we're going to use inferential statistics to determine whether the relationship is statistically significant. But even though we're doing a statistical test, we still have no causality. We'll look at the reasons for that a little bit later. And finally, um, experimental designs are the, are the one way that we can determine whether a causal relationship exists. And we figure it out 
by randomly assigning people to a treatment or condition. In fact, I have these two numbered coming up because these are the two rules to determine if it's an experiment. First, it must have random assignment. So people have to be randomly assigned to a condition or a treatment. Um, and secondly, there has to be a treatment. You have to do something to the participants. And these are the two strict must-haves in order to be an experiment. So this is our content we'll be looking at, and we will um, continue on from there um, with our description of descriptive methods. Descriptive methods. Descriptive methods answer what or how many types of questions. The purpose is to describe the world around us answering questions about what, how much, or who. The data could be presented in one of two ways. We go back to this distinction I made earlier between qualitative and quantitative research. So qualitative, as you know, is a narrative. It's going to be a lot of words and paragraphs and quotes from individuals because the individual is very important in qu qualitative research. And an individual could be a person or the individual could be like an organization, like a school. The individual could be like an informal group, like gangs. So all of these things um, could be the individuals of focus. And you would gather your data through a number of different ways. There are many more than I wrote here, but case study is one way where you would have a deep focus on one or a very small number of individuals who represent a category. Like if you are interested in studying um, let's say healing healers in the Navajo tradition, you might choose just a few and you would go deep with them and get data, get all kinds of written information, write down their stories, maybe long interviews, maybe information from their background, but you get a lot of deep information. Observation is simply watching and surveys and archival research. I've written them here under qualitative because sometimes in surveys you'll be asking open-ended questions and that would be part of your descriptive message. If you're asking questions that can be answered with numbers, then we would have surveys as part of your quantitative method. And archival research likely can fit into both categories. It can be, um, if you're looking at say old diaries and things like that, um, archives are old records, records from the past. And if you're looking at diaries and things like that, then you're going to have qualitative data. Otherwise, you'll have quantitative data um, if you're looking at, let's say, um, genetic data or something like that. So these can go either way. And observation, likewise, can go either way. But when you're presenting the quantitative piece, the data would be using graphs or charts. So you'd have frequencies, which is just counts of how many, mean, median, mode, standard deviation, all of these would be part of your quantitative approach. So the first method is observation, and observing subjects in the natural or lab setting would teach about behaviors and attitudes. Um, naturalistic observation would take place when um, you're in a natural setting where people have chosen to come by themselves. And so when we think of naturalistic, it's just a, um, a public setting or a school setting, a place where people have normally spend time. A laboratory observation an example is Ainsworth's strange situation in which children, young toddlers and their mothers were brought into a lab and a very specific protocol was followed wherein a stranger, a safe stranger, a student, but who was playing the role of a stranger entered the room and they observed through a two-way window the reactions of the child. However, a lab might be an official science lab 
but in psychology and in the human fields, it's more likely to be an office, or it could be an outdoor space. Any space that is controlled by the researcher is a lab. The person wouldn't normally go there, and so the researcher has control over the setting. And participatory observation is when the person is both participating in and documenting the information. I have an example here of a teacher who's teaching in the classroom and at the same time she's documenting a child's habits of outbursts. And the problems with these are that, um, first off, sometimes there might not be enough incidents to observe, like maybe this child doesn't misbehave in a day. Secondly, is you can't draw conclusions or generalize. This might be true just of that one person. And thirdly, is something called the Hawthorne effect or lab effect. And in a nutshell, it just means that when someone is observed, they are no longer acting naturally. It's called the Hawthorne effect because it was revealed when researchers were interested in the effect of light on work efficiency. And so they changed the lighting and then they came in and observed the workers. And they found that the workers were working very hard but then when they changed the lights permanently, that didn't persist and they weren't working as hard. And the reason seemed to be that they were being observed. And so they were on their best because they were being observed. So we have to be careful when we're observing that we're not impacting the outcomes. Method three is surveys. And we can have surveys that are self-report on a variety of topics. And surveys, um, it, they could be, so when you conduct a survey, if you use certain sampling methods and, and um, certain analytical techniques, then you can actually run statistical tests. But most surveys aren't using those methods, and so in this case, it's just descriptive statistics. And we think about, say, the informal surveys that newspapers and magazines or Facebook or something they put up, you know, um, which Star Wars character are you, you know, sort of a questionnaire. And they're guessing at good questions but they're not necessarily valid and reliable surveys. But in formal surveys, the questions are tested for, to know that they're valid and reliable. And those are measures that we'll be looking at coming up in about three weeks. The problems with surveys are these. Um, first is what's called non-response bias, which is those who respond are somehow different than those who do not respond. And so I'll just give you this example. If you've ever been in a restaurant and on the card table was a little place, a comment card, and you could, if you wanted to, pick up the comment card and write your answers about how your service was on that day. And I bet you, like me, tend not to really bother with that. But there are probably two circumstances when you do bother with it. The first is when it was really good, and the second is when it was really bad. And so if that's the case, then the ones who respond, those who had really bad or really good service, are different from those who don't respond, who are those who just had neutral service. The second is the desire to please the researcher. Um, individuals completing a survey might be trying to put what they think the researcher wants to hear. Like if I were to survey you at the end of class and say, how good was this class today? Well, you might just write down that it's good because you want to be polite, you want to be kind, and so forth, but that wouldn't get at your actual feelings. Thirdly, honesty. If we're really investigating something that is a challenging topic, it might be embarrassing or troubling and people might respond dishonestly. For example, when someone is addicted um, to a substance, they might be embarrassed or ashamed of that, and if you ask them about that on a survey, they might not acknowledge how much they drink or how much of a drug they use. Finally, sampling. Um, we have to be so careful to get samples that represent the population. And if we don't, then we're not going to really find out about the population. And so um, 
we'll go more over samples and population coming up. So this is just an overview. But the census, for example, has always a challenge um, documenting certain people. For instance, people who are illegal immigrants might not want to be counted, even though they're here in this country and living and participating. Another example is homeless people. It's hard to count people who don't have homes. And so the count isn't right unless they have sampled all of those populations equally. So great care has to be taken. Method four is archival research, which is simply an archive is a collection of historical records about a person or group of people. And so you can go back and get, oh, immigration records from way back, or you can get prison records or um, tax records or health records. And so an archive is these old records that can be used for research. And archival researchers review these records to look at history, patterns, anomalies, trends. And these could be qualitative if they're looking at, again, as I said, old diaries, or it could be quantitative if they're looking at, say, data from twin studies from way back. And so these are all the types of records that could be obtained. So that's the fourth type of research in the descriptive way. And all of these are descriptive that I've just described to you now. What you would be looking for to determine if it's descriptive is we often see data represented in something like a bar chart. Um, this is just an example of a bar chart. This could also be upright with the bars. You can see this is just showing the ages of these people. Um, and this is just showing the conditions that people had. And so this is showing the gender of the people they talked to. Descriptive researchers could be displayed in a pie chart, and this is just the percent of people by their working status. You know, 50, 43% were unemployed on temporary layoffs. This was a COVID thing. We could see descriptive research in a line graph, and what this is designed for is to show change across time. So this might be, let's say, 2011, 2012, 20. 13, 20, 14, or so forth, or it could be, you know, day one, day two, day three, and so forth. So it just shows the passage of time. If you have a time component, in this case, we can see that it's changed in COVID rates and back in 2020. And descriptive research could be a histogram. And a histogram just takes continuous data, like this is healthy oral body temperature. I realize you can't see this number, but they're showing the lowest healthy normal body temperature rate, and then up to the highest. And you can see most individuals are in the middle. All these bars are clustered together because the data are continuous, and there's not a break in between each of these, but they just broke them into groups. So those are some ways that we would display data. All that is descriptive research. We do have to be a little bit careful because some graphs can be misleading. Um, so here is your, this graph that we just looked at below. And it looks like um, many people over 80 died from COVID-19, many more than the um, other groups, but it's not as bad as it looks, right? Because this makes you almost think that it's like 100% of people but they truncated or cut short this graph to show, because this only goes up to 15%. And so even though even they just presented this out of scale, this graph should continue to way out to here and then it wouldn't look so bad because most of the people did not die. So that's a misleading graph with the proportions not representing that well. That's what it should look like if it accurately represented and it went all the way up to 100%. And even though it's still disturbing, it's not as disturbing as this. Graphs can also be misleading by presented the data simplistically. So um, here we just have, for example, the number of cases of COVID. But this isn't meaningful to us because we don't know how many people are here in the population. So for example, 
if Spain has 148,000 people uh, with co who have gotten sick, but they only have 300,000 in their country, well, that's a lot more significant. And so we have to take into account not just the numbers, but the numbers relative to the, po the whole population. Um, so this is cases per million. This makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? And now we have, well, the United States in this case not looking quite as bad. So up here we have the most cases, but it's because we have a bigger population. And now we're more in the middle and Spain pops up there to the top if we look at cases per million. The second method we're talking about will be correlational studies. Correlational studies answer one type of question. Do two factors or variables correspond or relate to one another? Or do two variables vary together? And this will sound really messy, but we'll have examples to follow. So the first thing to know is that these factors or variables can vary in the same direction, which means as one goes up, the other goes up, and these are called positive correlations, or they can go in the opposite direction, and those are called negative correlations. So here's some examples to help you make more sense of that. Let's say someone was interested in knowing, is there a relationship between meditation and coping skill? So here are our variables. Meditation is one variable, and coping skill is another variable. And so the question we ask is, does coping skill increase as meditation increases? In other words, does your coping skill tend to improve as the number of minutes you meditate increases? And so a negative correlation might be something like this. Is there a relationship between weight and exercise? And so you might phrase it differently. Do minutes per week of exercise tend to be higher when weights are lower. So as exercise increases, does body weight decrease? Correlational designs are depicted on what's called a scatter plot or a scattergram. And um, this is how you set it up. So let's take a look here at what we have. So imagine that a person hypothesized that health and happiness are in some way related. That is, when one changes, the other one changes in a similar way. And so you're asked this, variable one, health, you're asked to rate your health on a scale of one to 10. And there is the health variable on the x-axis. And variable two, happiness, you're asked to rate your happiness on a scale of one to 10. And there is your second, um, variable. And each of you would produce two numbers. So maybe the first person said their health was about a, a six and their happiness was about a five. So we would follow up to the six over to the five and we put a point right here. And that would represent the first person who answered the survey. Maybe the second one thought their health was an eight and their happiness was a seven. And so we put a point right here. This would be person two. The third person didn't feel very healthy, but they felt pretty happy. They were right about here. Maybe we have someone who's really healthy, but kind of struggling with feeling happy, just broke up or something. Maybe these were all the points that are in this distribution. Maybe the distribution looks something like this. And these are all the points from all the people in the room who responded. So this would be, the first thing we do is we look at kind of in what direction the points are going. And to me, they look like they're going in an upward direction. Whoops, I don't know why that happened. And so we would say, because it's in an upward direction, we'd say this is positive. Now, this doesn't mean good, no. This doesn't mean beneficial. All it means is that as one variable goes up, the other goes up, or as one variable goes down, the other go down. In other words, the two variables are changing together. Another thing that we can measure is how strong the relationship is. So this is a measure of direction. 
but we can also measure strength. And we measure strength by looking at how far each point is from this line of best fit that we've drawn. So the line of best fit, sorry about those automatic things happening, the line of best fit is the line that's closest to the points as much as possible so that it encompasses most of the points. And then we measure all these little distances. And the closer they are to the line, the stronger the relationship. So strength, how close are the points to the line? And direction, either the arrow is pointing upward or perhaps it would be pointing downward. So those are the basic idea of a scatter plot or scatter gram. So let's look at some more examples. The scatter plot or scatter gram depicts data from two continuous variables. We'll talk more about this idea later, so don't worry about that. But it just means variables that are quantitative or number based that um, can that fall anywhere along a continuum, like people's ages or people's height. Someone very many different possible values are there. So each point like this represents an individual score. The axes represent the range of values possible for each value variable. The axes are the arrows going in either direction. The line of best fit is a line that's drawn as close to as many points as can be. We would interpret this particular thing with minutes played in the game on the x-axis and points scored on the y-axis. We would say as minutes played increases for our players, points scored also increases. Or there's a relationship between minutes played and points scored. We would not say playing more minutes causes a person to score more points. We'll talk about this more a little later. So we quantify the relationship as already indicated by strength, and that would fall on a scale of zero to one, with one being much stronger and zero being there's not a relationship. And also a direction, which would be a minus sign or a plus sign. And if all the points are right on the line, that would be a perfect relationship. It would have a score of one, a perfect score. If all the points are on the line, but they're going in a downward direction, here's the direction. This would be a perfect correlation, but it would be a negative score. And this was what it would look like if it was no correlation at all. So this is a very weak correlation and these two are strong correlations. We'll be covering all of this again later. So this is just your exposure to these ideas. So there's the R value that tells how strong it is. These are both ones, they're equally strong, but this one is negative and this one is positive. And this one is approximately zero. So the plus minus sign represents the direction of the plot, like this. This goes in an upward direction. Hours revising your paper or your ex written exam leads to higher scores on your exam results. It's a positive relationship. As the number of hours revising increases, exam results increase. Negative means the direction is downward. And we could think about flu shots. And as the number of flu shots increases, the number of people with flu decreases. Don't misconstrue negative as meaning bad or weak, and don't misconstrue positive as being good. That's a common mistake, but all it talks about is the direction of the relationship. No judgment on goodness or badness. Here are some examples we might do in class. You can sort of see um, these are the guidelines. If plus 0.8, that would be strong. Moderate would be plus or minus 0.5. Weak would be plus or minus 0.2. And uh, larger numbers of participants 
mean higher correlation coefficients. The coefficient is just this value, 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, or any values in between. So if we had a strong relationship that was positive, meaning both variables increased together, it might look like this. A strong negative might look like this. Moderate, the points are a little further from our imaginary line of best fit. Here's our maybe our line, and you can see the points are a little further away. And here's a moderate negative. There's our straight line of best fit, and the points are a bit farther away. Weak positive, you can see the points are getting quite a bit further. And I, there we go. And a weak negative, once again, the points are further. So the big caution about correlational studies, they're easy to do because you just need to gather data on two variables, but they don't imply causation. And remember, causation is that magical thing that we always want to be getting in Western scientific psychology. We always want to show that A causes B, but we can't do this with a correlational study. Here's an example that might help you understand why. Sleeping with shoes on is strongly correlated with waking up with a headache. Now, if we were going to draw a linear conclusion, we would conclude that as shoes, that shoes cause headaches. But actually, there's a confound. The common cause of sleeping with shoes on is that a person maybe went out drinking the night before. And so that means that instead of the shoes causing the headache, that's not the case. In fact, it was the drinking that caused the shoes and caused the headache. And so that's an example of a confounding variable that complicates the relationship, but that's what we try to avoid when we're doing quantitative analysis. So here's some examples of how this is often misinterpreted. So um, many correlational studies are, if they get to make the news, the news people often misreport them as causal relationships. So you can see here this headline that was based on a correlation between hours of Facebook use and levels of depression in teenage girls. And the conclusion that they drew was that Facebook causes depression in teenage girls. A linear relationship, A causes B. But there's a problem with this. It could be that Facebook causes depression, that somehow going on Facebook a lot causes girls to maybe do a lot of social comparison and makes them feel depressed about their own state. But it could also be the opposite. Depression causes girls to go on Facebook more. Maybe if girls are depressed, they're not going out, they're not doing very much, and so they're staying home a lot, which leaves more time to go online on social media. And so maybe the fact that they're depressed is what causes them to go on Facebook more. Finally, there could be some other unknown factor that causes them to feel depressed and causes them to go on Facebook a lot. We would call this a confound. And that unknown factor could be something like bullying. Maybe they're being bullied. So they're feeling depressed about that and it's making them anxious. So they're checking in with Facebook a lot. Or maybe some sort of neglect. You know, their parents are having a hard time and neglecting them. And so they're depressed and they're not having much monitoring of their social media. So you see, if we have a high correlation, we cannot conclude that one factor causes the other. And to put this into maybe a different way to think about it, we could say it could be the expected cause effect, X causes Y, that Facebook use X could cause the depression by causing girls to compare themselves unfavorably with others. But it could be the reverse of that, Y causes X. Or in other words, depression causes increase in Facebook use. Having depression, why might cause a person to go on Facebook a lot, 
because they've withdrawn from other activities. Or there could be some third variable unknown that causes both X and Y. A third factor, such as parental neglect, might cause a person to both feel depressed and escape into Facebook a lot. And so here again, we conclude that causal conclusions may not be drawn from correlational findings. So our takeaways, correlation shows a relationship between two variables. Correlation data are depicted in a scatter plot. The relationship between the two variables can be positive, meaning that as one gets stronger, so it's the other. The relationship between the two variables can be negative or inverse, so that as one variable gets stronger, the other gets weaker. The strength is measured on a scale from zero to one, and correlation does not determine causation. In this content, we'll be talking about the last method, experimental designs, the only design that can show a causal relationship that is so desired in Western science. Terms to watch for are these. Independent variable, which is the variable you'll manipulate um, or that you expect to impact the outcome. The dependent variable is the one you will measure in which you expect the change to occur like cholesterol, and I'll give you lots of examples. And then we do have some different types of variables that I'm just going to articulate right now, but we'll be going into more detail later in this term. Nominal variables, that variables that just differ by name, like eye color. Ordinal values, variables are variables that differ by name, but there are value differences in the groups like low, medium, and high income. And continuous variables fall at any point within a range, like weight, IQ, income, and so forth. So here's an example. An independent variable is a variable of change. So imagine we're trying to answer the question, um, what, to what extent does the amount of water impact the outcomes for the plant? And so what we're going to do is control the amount of water. We're going to create equal conditions, so the same plots, same pots, the same soil, the same seeds, but we're going to give one plant a moderate amount of water, one plant a high amount of water, moderate amount of water, a high amount of water, and one plant just a little water. And then we're going to measure how they do. And what can we measure? We can measure the size, the number of leaves, whether it's living or dead. Well, that's a dependent variable because it, this outcome on this variable depends on the amount of water. And so we can see here that this plant that got a moderate amount of water seems to have flourished, four leaves, longer stems. This plant that got a lot of water seems to have died, and the plant that didn't get very much water at all seems to be less flourishing but still alive. And so in this case, the independent variable is what we controlled. We controlled water. And the dependent variable is what we measured, and we measured the health of the plant. In another example, we have an independent variable that is going to be medicine type. And there's going to be two. There's going to be the real medicine that we think is going to have some benefit, and then some sort of a placebo that looks like the real medicine but isn't and we're not going to tell anyone which kind they're getting and then we're going to measure how health is so the health we hypothesize depends on the type of medicine and so this is the dependent variable what we measure and the independent variable is what we change or, or we manipulate and one other example we have um, the question of whether uh, a different type of treatment for alcoholism has an impact on how much people drink. And so in this case, it's not water anymore. 
It's the type of treatment. Here's treatment A. Here's treatment B. Treatment A is Alcoholics Anonymous. Treatment B is group therapy that looks kind of like AA, but it doesn't include the tenets of AA. And at the end, we measure something. We measure how much alcohol the person consumes. So the amount of alcohol a person consumes, we hypothesize, depends on the type of therapy. And so we would measure alcohol abuse by a validated scale each week during treatment. And in the end, we'd find out, ah, either the type of therapy impacts alcohol use or it doesn't. So in this case, I've put up a few examples and ask you to consider what is the independent and dependent variable. A researcher studied whether children who ate high sugar breakfast cereals were more likely to behave aggressively during recess than children who ate low sugar breakfast cereals. And in this case, what we're measuring is aggressive behavior. And so that is our DV, our dependent variable, aggressive behavior. And our independent variable is the high sugar or low sugar of the breakfast cereal. And so I would just say the variables are here, the breakfast cereal, high sugar versus low sugar. This is our IV or our independent variable and our DV is aggression. In another example, a scientist suspected that people were more likely to embud into a line, like a line of people waiting. Someone's more likely to butt ahead if that line is made up of strangers than if it's made up of acquaintances. And in this case, the two variables are the composition of the line and whether a person butts into the line. So we're going to measure line butting, our DV, because we think it depends on who's in the line, which is our IV. A woman thought that people would remember a list of words more accurately if they slept than if they did not sleep after studying the list. And in this case, we have two variables, sleep and word memory. And so we think word memory is what we're going to measure. So this is our dependent variable, and we think it depends on sleep. And so sleep is our independent variable. So experimental designs, which are also sometimes called randomized controlled trials, um, are the only way to determine causality. And this is the magic word in statistics. We always after causality. And in order to be an experiment or an RCT, it has to have two things. And the first is the manipulation or treatment. We have to do something to participants. And the second is random assignment of subjects to a condition. So they have to be randomly assigned. And here's a review of these terms that we went over before. A variable is any factor that varies or differs among subjects. An independent variable is what is controlled by the researcher. And a dependent variable is what is being measured. So I'm not going to worry about this terminology, but we'll go through this example. And in class, we'll be watching some little videos and things like this. But Hopefully you'll review this at least ahead of time. So here we have our patients. We randomly assign some to a treatment group and some to a control group. And then we follow up and compare their results. Simple design. Some more designs. Does giving cause happiness? So the manipulation, subjects are given $5 and randomly assigned to one of three conditions. So this is a real experiment and it was with students and students were invited in the morning to come to the lab and they were given $5. And they were just told one of three things and then they needed to come back at the end of the day. And so in the first condition, if they were randomly assigned this, the researcher told them, buy a gift for someone else and stop back at the end of the day. In the second condition, they were told, buy something for yourself and stop back at the end of the day. In the third condition, they were just given the $5 and told, stop back at the end of the day. And so in this case, the independent variable is spending instruction, buying for someone else, buying for yourself, or control. 
and the dependent variable what was going to be measured at the end of the day was happiness. Um, so it was a true experiment because there was a manipulation, which is the instructions about the $5, and there was random assignment to one of the conditions. So it is an experiment. And in fact, the results were that givers, the ones who gave a gift to someone else, reported higher levels of happiness upon return than those who bought for themselves or the control group. And we'll just, we can't address this here because it's just me talking. So the big thing for what you're doing this week is you need to be able to tell if it's descriptive, correlational, or experimental. So descriptive quantitative studies, if it mentions graphs and frequency tables, that's descriptive. If it's only giving data for the people who provided the data, there's no attempt to generalize to more people. There's not a sample drawn and then they try and generalize to everybody. And you wouldn't see statistical tests in a descriptive study. In a correlational study, you might see the word relationship or correspondence. The strength might be shown in a Pearson R value. It would say R equals, and it would be a value from 0 to 1. And you wouldn't see causal conclusions drawn. And experimental studies require those two key components that we discussed, random assignment and a treatment or condition or manipulation. The researcher has to do something to the participants. And that's all.